at the end of the, lec of the last lecture, I asked you a question um, about uh, whether we should consider neutrinos to be a Dirac particle just from the fact that neutrinos which are produced in neutron beta decay, which we call electron anti neutrinos, are not the same as neutrinos which can be detected through the uh, chlorine uh, experiment of Davis, which was used actually for the detection of solar neutrinos. And actually what Davis did, he put his detector close, not, not the, the solar one, the smaller one, but on the same time, close to the nuclear reactor, and tried to see if a huge flux of electron anti neutrinos coming out of the reactor can induce uh, some detection process in his detector. And the idea was to see if electron anti neutrinos produced in the reactor is the same as electron neutrino or not. And the result was negative. So no signal was discovered. So the question was, can this be considered as a proof that neutrinos are actually Dirac particles or not? So uh, that was the question I asked you at the end of my last lecture. Is there any answer? Anyone going to answer this question? Any idea? <coughs> is the negative result is just due to the fact that neutrinos are Dirac particles? And they're different from their own tiny neutrinos? Now you should know this already. So the answer is of course no. We still do not know whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. And it will be really tough to find it out. There are some experiments, I will discuss them, which are intended to, to uh, answer this question. But in reality, we don't really know whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana. And from the fact that in the Davis experiment at reactors, no signal has been seen, it doesn't follow at all that neutrinos are Dirac particles. The reason is that the weak interactions are chiral. So the state which is produced in the uh, neutron beta decay, or uh, in the decay of nuclei uh, in, in nuclear reactors, which we call electron anti neutrinos, they are right handed. And the particles which can be detected by the Davis experiment are left handed. And uh, the fact that we don't see that is simply a consequence of the fact that the neutrino mass is extremely small. The, as I said, left handed and right handed particles are different, but the chirality is not conserved in nature. What is exactly conserved is a helicity. Chirality is not conserved. So in principle, even uh, produced right-handed antineutrinos could induce some signal in the Davis experiment because they have some probability to, to get a wrong chirality. But the probability is proportional to the neutrino mass. And, and actually, the factor which enters into this probability is the ratio of the neutrino mass to the typical energy of the process squared. And if we know that neutrino mass is lighter than one electron volt, and the typical energy of reactor neutrinos is about 3 to 4 mEV, you can immediately find out what will be the ratio squared. It's negligible. And that was the reason why no signal has been seen. It does not mean at all that neutrinos are Dirac particles. We still don't know whether they are Dirac or Mayra. Very simple, just due to the chiral nature of weak interaction, that they are left-handed, actually, B minus A. Okay, now let us proceed further. I finished my lecture yesterday uh, with deriving this expression. Sometimes I feel like having three bands. Uh, we deriving this expression, which is so-called the master formula for the probability of neutrino oscillations in value. Now, there's a very interesting um, special case of this formula, which is um, the case for two flavor neutrino oscillation. Forget that we have three neutrino flavors in the world, they just consider two flavors. And it turns out that that's very good. First of all, it's a very convenient approximation because the formulas are simplified considerably. But in addition, it's a very useful approximation because in many cases, the full three flavor oscillation picture can be reduced in the first approximation to a sequence of two flavor oscillations. And we'll see why this is actually possible. Now, if I have only two neutrino flavors, mu e and mu mu, and uh, the neutrino flavor states are linear superpositions of 
on mass eigenstates mu1 and mu2, then the coefficients of this uh, superposition can be uh, written in this way. So the leptonic mixing matrix, which we discussed in the previous lecture, can be written in a very simple form, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, and for brevity I use C and S um, as a notation for cosine and sine. Okay? And this is actually an orthogonal transformation, not even a unitary, because there is no complexity, no complex factors. And by using the general formula, which I derived yesterday, you can immediately find out the formula for the transition probability in the two flavor case. It has a, this very simple and at the same time a remarkable structure. It has a product of two squared signs. The first sine square of twice the mixing angle gives you the amplitude of the oscillations. And the argument of the second sine square gives you the frequency of the oscillation, how fast the oscillations occur. Um, the mixing angle actually characterizes the mismatch between the flavor eigenstate basis and the mass eigenstate basis. If this mismatch is zero, they are aligned, then there is no oscillation, suppose, if flavor state coincides with, with mass eigenstate. And there is no mixing in this case, so theta is zero, there is no oscillations. On the other hand, if the mixing angle is 90 degrees, again we align the flavor state with the mass eigenstate, but just interchanging the, the numbers of the mass eigenstate, one and two. In this case, again, there is no oscillations. The oscillations are maximal, uh, the amplitude of the oscillation is maximal uh, when the mixing angle is 45 degrees, just between uh, zero and 90 degrees. So in this case, we have a maximal mismatch between the basis of uh, flavor eigenstate and the mass eigenstate. Now, the frequency depends on the mass square difference. If the neutrinos are degenerate in mass, you will never see any oscillations at all. And depend, of course, on the distance traveled by neutrinos between their production point and their detection point. So in order to see the oscillation, you need the distance between the neutrino source and detector to be large enough. If you put your detector too close to, to the source, you would not see any oscillation because the phase will be negligibly small. Now, I gave you several problems at my last, last lecture and the previous one, and I want to continue with this, so some more problems now. First, derive this formula from the general expression for neutrino oscillation probability. And second, go back to the normal units in which H bar and C are not equal to one. Reinstate all the necessary factors of H bar and C and look how the formula will uh, uh, look in this case. And then after that, please find the limit of classic, the classical limit and non-relativistic limits of the oscillation probability and see what you get as a result. Okay, uh, quite often the phase of, of the sine square, the second sine square, is uh, presented in the form as pi times the distance traveled by, by the neutrinos divided by the so-called oscillation length. But the oscillation length is given by this very simple expression. 4 pi times the momentum of neutrino divided by uh, the delta mass square. Delta m square is, by definition, m2 square minus m1 square here. Uh, and in convenient units, it can be written as 2.48 meters times momentum of neutrinos in MeV divided by delta m square in electron volt square. Or if you prefer, if you work with high energies, you can use a very similar expression, 2.48 kilometers times the momentum in G, again divided by delta m square in electron volt square. Will be the same numerical coefficient. Now, what happens if neutrinos propagate very long distance? Then this oscillation phase becomes quite large. And since every detector has a finite energy resolution, we'll have to take an average of the neutrino energy over, uh, over this energy resolution. And for very large value of the oscillation phase, this would lead to an averaging effect of neutrino oscillation. As a result, instead of this simple oscillatory uh, picture, this corresponds to the transition probability. And this is just the survival probability, which is one minus transition probability 
instead you will have this kind of picture. With increasing distance, the amplitude um, of the neutrino oscillation will be damped. And this happens when the oscillation phase is large. This will also happen if you take into account that the neutrino source and neutrino detector have finite length. They are not point-like. So this again, at very long distances, will, this will lead to the averaging out of neutrino oscillations. By the way, here on this picture you can see uh, the meaning of the parameters in that form. Psi squared two theta is the amplitude of oscillation, so this the distance between zero and maximum probability of neutrino transition. And the oscillation length is just the distance in, in space between two uh, nearby maxima or minima of the oscillation curve. This is the oscillation length. For example, if you start from zero and want to have maximum transition, you need to put your detector at half of the oscillation length. Uh, it is very convenient for the future discussion uh, to express the neutrino oscillation probability as a solution of the evolution equation. Now, what is the evolution equation? It looks very much like a Schrodinger equation. It's a Schrodinger-like equation, actually. So we can consider the evolution of neutrinos either in space or in time. But as I discussed yesterday, for point like neutrinos, when we neglect the size of the neutrino wave packet compared to all distances of interest, uh, we can just consider on the equal footing the time of neutrino propagation and the distance propagated by neutrinos. And then we can write that the, uh, the flavor vector in the flavor state, nu e and nu mu, uh, prop um, changes the time according to this equation where the Hamiltonian effect of Hamiltonian in the flavor space is given by the rotated Hamiltonian in, in the mass identity. So we know already that the matrix u rotates from uh, mass again state to the flavor state. So we have to rotate this uh, uh, vector back on the mass eigenstate base, evolve it with the mass eigenstate uh, Hamiltonian, and then rotate it back on the flavor eigenstate base. Next, we take into account that neutrinos are relativistic, and we use this simple uh, formula for relativistic neutrinos, and we express the effective Hamiltonian in the flavor space in this simple form. And after that, we should notice, and that's an important thing, which I would like to ask you to check as another exercise, that we can always subtract from the Hamiltonian any term proportional to the unit matrix, or add it to the Hamiltonian if you wish. So if we do this, this would be equivalent to rephrasing all the components of the neutrino vector of state in the flavor state by the same fact. And what enters into the oscillation probability is only the, the phase difference, not the, the common phase. So multiplying by a common phase, both states will not change the oscillation probability. And adding or subtracting uh, a term to the Hamiltonian, which is proportional to the unit matrix, is exactly equivalent to multiplying these uh, components of the internal wave function by the same phase factor. So we can get rid of this common factor P here, and instead of mass square, uh, write down delta mass square, m2 square minus m1 square. And in the end, if we substitute the expression for u, for two flavor case, which I just discussed before, cosine sine minus sine cosine, multiply three matrices, we get this evolution equation. So this is the evolution equation for neutrino oscillations in value. There was one ch cheat here. I cheated you a little bit. The cheat was in this place. By using this expression, I assume that different neutrino flavor, uh, mass eigenstates have the same momentum. Of course, their energies are then different because the masses are different. I assume that they have the same momentum. Many people do that. If you look at the literature on neutrino oscillations, you can find two different assumptions. Some people assume that the momentum of different mass eigenstates is the same. Some people assume that but the energies are the same, but the momentum are different. And there's some even fight between these two camps, which, uh, which of the two should be equal for a different mass against it. The answer is, I may discuss it in my last lecture, if I have enough time. The answer is that both are wrong. And there is no reason absolutely to believe that different matter, uh, mass against it entering into a flavor state have either the same energy or the same momentum. And actually, it, 
was seen already in my derivation of the general formula. I never used that. But the point is that if you use this assumption, even though it was wrong, you get the right result. So that was the cheat which I used here, just to simplify the derivation. You can do it without it. it can, actually, it will be a little bit more complicated, but you can do it without assuming the same energy or same amount. And that's the right way to do it, but it's just not important. And then you arrive at this evolution equation for neutrino oscillations, two flavor neutrino oscillations in that. Now you can solve this system of equations. This is actually a system of two coupled differential equations with constant coefficients. So it can be very easily solved. My next exercise is to ask you to solve this system of differential equation and to make sure that you get the same result for oscillation probability and survival probability, which is just one minus transition probability. Uh, one useful relation or a couple of useful relations which uh, I will use also in my future lectures is the following. If you have a real 2 by 2 symmetric matrix like this, then the angle of rotation which would diagonalize it is easily given uh, by this formula. The tangent of twice this angle of rotation is given by twice the over diagonal element divided by the difference of the diagonal elements. This is you know, the rule of a thumb which is very useful actually. So you, mean, you look at 2 by 2 matrix, symmetric matrix, you immediately know the mixing angle which diagonalizes it. You don't have to do it uh, in new for every new 2 by 2 matrix. Okay? And the eigenvalues of this matrix are given by the half of the sum of the diagonal elements plus or minus square root of this expression. Okay? So that's very useful for us. Uh, now, as I said, the mixing angle is given by this expression, and if you go back to, to the Hamiltonian, which I just discussed, you immediately find that indeed th this mixing angle is the angle which diagonalizes this Hamiltonian. Uh, now, what about the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues are given again by this expression, and if you find them, you, uh, if you calculate them, you find that they are equal to plus or minus delta m square over 2e. After I subtracted this common term from on the diagonal on the effective from the top. Okay. Uh, and the oscillation length in general is given by the 2 pi divided by this difference of the eigenvalues. And which immediately gives us uh, the standard oscillation length. You remember when I discussed the simple two-level two quantum mechanical system. Uh, how you can uh, find the oscillation between the levels of two system, uh, two, two, um, two state system, and which can be found in every quantum mechanics textbook. Uh, I had the oscillation factor which was proportional to one half, uh, the phase was proportional to one half of the energy difference, and the oscillation length is just the inverse of, of, of that uh, times the pi. Okay, now. Maybe before I go to the next topic, uh, in my previous lecture, I said that the part of the electroweak Lagrangian, the standard model Lagrangian, which is important for neutrino oscillations, consists of the charge current interaction Lagrangian and mass terms for charged electrons and for neutrinos. And I didn't say anything about neutral current interactions. Now, are neutral current interactions important for neutrino oscillations or not? Well, it's not difficult to, to give a simple answer to that. So the neutral current interaction contains expression like uh, and alpha takes the values E, mu, tau, and I assume the sum of alpha. That's uh, Lagrangian of uh, neutral current interactions of, of neutrinos. Interaction with Z ball. Now, if we go instead to the mass eigenstate using the expression that mu alpha is u alpha i mu i, where i uh, stands for mass eigenstate, you immediately will see that instead of this, I can write down this and take the sum of i. So it doesn't matter whether we consider the decay of z 
three bosons into flavor states or into mass epic states. So it looks like uh, neutrinos produced in the decays of Z bosons cannot oscillate because we don't know whether they are flavor state or mass eigenstate. Or mass eigenstate never oscillates in that. Okay? However, this is not the full answer. So next question I would suggest you to think about is the following. Can neutrinos, can there be any situation when neutrinos from Z boson decay still can oscillate? So I told you that I'll give you several uh, exercise problems and most of them will be very trivial. This one is not. This is not a trivial question. And I don't expect a full answer from you to this question because actually the full answer was given in a very good paper by Zasetin and Smirnov, uh, published in Modern Physics Letters. Uh, but if you can have at least some idea in what situation one can expect neutrinos from Z boson to take oscillate, that would be very interesting. Think about this. You don't have to give the answer right now. But yesterday you answered that uh, you answered that question, didn't you? Sorry? And yesterday you answered this question, didn't you? No, I, I, I repeated it oh, once it again. It was a wrong answer. No, it, it's not a full answer. Let me say it better. It's not a full answer. It's not a wrong answer. It's not a full answer. But I, I even actually answered it once again. Uh, in the first part of my argument, <coughs> that you don't expect any oscillation from neutrinos of neutrinos produced in uh, Z boson decay. But as I am saying, it's not a full answer. Try to think about this. Somebody knows that. So that's a famous example of the Einstein Podolsky Rosen. Paradox. If you have a two detector experiment in which you measure the flavor of both neutrinos and one of them detects an electron neutrino, then the probability that the other will detect muon neutrino will oscillate with distance between, not between the two detectors, but between the two detectors and, and the point of decay of Z boson. So assume this is Z boson, it decays into two neutrinos, okay? U1, oh, okay, UA. UB. And we have two detectors here. If UA is a flavor state, then the probability of finding UB will oscillate with distance which is equal uh, with standard formula depending on the distance L equal to the sum L1 plus L2. This is the answer. So this is a, an example of the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. By measuring the flavor of one of the state, you define the flavor of the other state produced in the same decay. But if you have only one detector, you will never see any oscillations of such nutrients at all. No, 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 that's extremely difficult. It was never experimentally uh, tried to, to see this. It's a very difficult experiment. So you, you need a very, very big flux of Z boson and two detectors. So even detecting one neutrino is a difficult problem. Uh, the probability is typically quite low because of weak interaction. Now you have to detect two neutrinos from the same, same decay of the same Z boson simultaneously. So it's, it's a thought experiment. It's not a real experiment. But we know the answer. That's very interesting answer that in principle you can observe oscillation of such interference. Well, another interesting question, another thought experiment, or, or so to say. Imagine a world in which charged leptons, electron, muon, and tau charged leptons are masses. Would neutrinos oscillate in such a world? Can anyone answer right now? No, the answer is no, of course. Because you cannot define the mixture in this case. If charged leptons are exactly massless, we can always rotate charged leptons by any unitary transformation you wish without uh, changing anything in, in the Lagrangian, and you can compensate the mixing matrix coming from the neutrino 
mathematics diagonalization in the charge current of Lagrangian. And therefore, the mixing is unphysical in this case. In the world in which electron, muon, and tau charge electrons uh, would be massless, there would be no neutrino oscillations. Okay, let's go further. And the topic I want to discuss now is actually when can neutrino oscillations be observed? Well, as I said, they, uh, we, we need a detector which is not very close to the source. But that's not the, the only condition. There are some other conditions under which neutrino oscillations are observed. So what are these conditions? These are so-called coherence conditions. In order for neutrino oscillation to be observed, we need the neutrino flavor state to be a coherent superposition of different mass eigenstate. What do I mean by coherence? By this I mean that every mass eigenstate contributing to the process of neutrino production, propagation, and detection should be added with contribution of any other mass eigenstate at the amplitude level, not at the probability level. So we calculate the amplitudes of the neutrino mass eigenstate to be produced in a certain process, propagate and be detected, and then we do the same for different mass eigenstate, and we should add the amplitudes and not the probabilities. This means that they are coherent. If you can de determine in the neutrino production process or in the neutrino detection process which mass eigenstate you produce or you detect, you will never see neutrino oscillations because mass eigenstate do not oscillate. So the condition for neutrino oscillations to be observable is that first of all, the different mass eigenstate uh, composing a given flavor state must be produced coherently, must propagate coherently, must be detected coherently. Now, let me elaborate on this a little bit. How can you break the coherence of neutrino production of different mass eigenstates? Assume you measure the energies of momenta and momenta of particles participating in neutrino production process with very high accuracy. If you can do that, then by using the energy and momentum conservation laws, you can find the energy and momentum of the produced neutrino with very high accuracy. But if you do that by using this simple formula for neutristic particles, you can find the mass of the neutrino with very high accuracy. But if you find the mass with the accuracy which is better than the difference between the different masses, you know which mass I can say you produce. And in this case, you will not observe any oscillations at all. Now, if there are questions, please ask me, because that's a very important point. I will elaborate a little bit more about that. Uh, How uh, fast uh, uh, possible? Uh, you always produce a flavor against it, not mass against it. Well, in principle, you can produce a state in principle, I'm saying. It's, it's tough, actually. Uh, you can produce a state which is a mass against it. So what we are saying is... Uh, 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 Okay, so assume we have a process pi plus mu two mu plus plus mu mu, okay? And then we say that mu mu can be written as uh, u mu i mu i, okay? Here I already assume that this is a coherent superposition. But I can say differently. I can say find the case into mu plus plus mu one with a weight u mu one squared, mu two with a weight mu mu two squared, and mu three, uh, sorry, mu three, the third mass of this state, with a weight u mu three squared. So the mixing here just means that different mass eigenstate are produced in different branch equations. Okay? But again, this is the same process in which the charged muon is produced. The only thing which is different is that the coherence production conditions are not satisfied. Let me explain a little bit in more detail how this can happen. Flavor state uh, can consist of, of different mass eigenstates, yes? Once again? Uh, 
flavor in this state which you produce uh, yeah. could consist of different methods in this case. All right. Well, it, it, it essentially. But here, suppose you measure momentum. Right. Right. And it is either new one, only two, or new three, with probabilities given by these factors. So, out of hundred decays, you will find uh, hundred multiplied by this factor, new one, hundred multiplied by this factor, new two, and hundred multiplied by this factor, new three. And the sum of, of this is equally hundred because this is unit unitary matrix. So, if you really can measure the energy and momentum of the decaying pile and muon, produced muon, with infinite accuracy, you kill all oscillations. The point is that you can never do that. Sorry. But uh, you can measure flavor of, uh, when you detect the machine, uh, you measure flavor. flavor. I mean, you detect muon or electron or tau. Okay, okay. And so when, when you have a detection process, you have exactly the same situation. Exactly the same. You will detect muon neutrino with a weight given by this formula. You will decay, uh, uh, sorry, you will decay uh, new one with the weight given by this expression, new two with this one, and new three with this one. And that's exactly the same. Well, the situation with the decay and uh, production, so production and detection is completely symmetric. Sorry for it, but there is a good thing to think about. Oscillation is a quantum mechanical phenomenon, quantum mechanical interference phenomenon. Interference means that you need several amplitudes which can interfere. Yes. Only in this case you can see oscillations. And if they cannot interfere, you will never see an oscillation. Now the question is, I, I mentioned that you need very good accuracy or to kill the oscillation, or not very good accuracy to allow the oscillation. Now the question is, what defines this accuracy? It's not that you, you your detector or your, your tool which you use to measure the energy and momentum of, of different particles is not very good. Assume you are a bad experimentalist. So you, you made a tool with very bad resolution. But that's not what I'm talking about. There is some accuracy beyond which you in principle cannot measure energy and momentum. And this is related to the space-time localization of your process through the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. So what I'm talking about is this ultimate quantum mechanical energy and momentum uncertainty. And it is always there. You cannot kill it. The only question is whether it is big enough or small enough to, to allow neutrino oscillation or to kill neutrino oscillation. And that's just a, a qualitative question. You have to check this and see whether neutrino oscillation can occur or not. How can you do that? Well, if you know that your source is localized within some special region, but well, what I'm saying source is not necessarily uh, the macroscopic uh, object in which there are many particles decaying. So by this I mean the localization of each individual decaying pion, for example, in this particular case. Okay? You, you, can, you know that it is localized within a certain range. And this localization is produced by interaction of pion with some other particles which produce something like a box in which, which uh, make pi localized in a given space region, okay? And this, I mean, just for simplicity, I call it a box. The interaction with the walls of the box produces localization. In fact, it's not the walls of the box, but some other particles which are uh, responsible for this localization of the pi, okay? And the localization region uh, gives you the momentum uncertainty. Each bar divided by this size of the localization region gives you the momentum uncertainty. And on the other hand, the time scale of the process for the free pile is just the, the decay width of the pile. 
the time it takes a pile to decay, okay, the average lifetime of the pile, gives you the time scale of the process, which gives you the energy answer. And you cannot go beyond it, whatever you do. And then you just have to take this and compare this with, with the important parameters here. Now let's discuss how one can do this. So assume we know what is the energy and momentum uncertainty with which we can find out the energy and momentum of neutrino. So we measure neutrino by measuring the energy and momentum of particles participating in its production or detection. I'm talking about production, but detection is exactly the same. It's the same argument. Okay? And by knowing this with some accuracy, we can find the neutrino energy and momentum with accuracy uh, sigma e and sigma p, uncertainty of energy and momentum. Okay? Then we can immediately find that uncertainty of the inferred neutrino mass will be given by this expression. And if this uncertainty is smaller than the difference between different neutrino masses, then you give oscillations. Then you know the, which exactly mass I can say to you emitted. If it is bigger than the difference between different masses of different mass eigenstates, then the oscillations are allowed. So it's a qualitative question. You just have to check this. You just take the known values and check and see if the oscillations are allowed or the coherence is killed. And the answer is that practically in all processes we know, the coherence of neutrino production and detection is very well satisfied. And the reason for this is that neutrinos are very, very light. The masses are so small, and of course, if masses are small, the mass square differences are also very small. So it's very difficult to find a, a, an example in which the coherence of neutrino production at the, or detection can be violated. However, jumping a little bit ahead, going to a topic which I was planning to discuss later, if we ask the question, can charged electrons oscillate, the situation will be completely different. Because charged electrons are pretty heavy on this mass scale. And this will be actually the answer to the question. OK, okay now let me continue. Uh, this is what I already discussed. Is the uncertainty of the inferred between the mass square is smaller than the mass square difference? We kill between oscillations. Now, how can we understand it in different terms, in maybe more physical terms? Let me go back to the formula for sigma m squared. If sigma m squared is small, that means that both these terms should be small, okay? under the square root. And in particular, this means that uh, sigma uh, p, 2p sigma p, should be also smaller than delta m squared. It's one of these terms under the square root. But this means, in turn, that sigma p should be smaller than delta m squared over 2p, which is essentially the inverse oscillation length. And the fact that we know the neutrino momentum with uncertainty, which is smaller the oscillation than the oscillation length, means automatically through the Heisenberg relation that the inverse quantity, which is the coordinate uncertainty of the neutrino production point, is bigger than the oscillation length. So what happens in this case is that the localization properties of the neutrino production process is such that we cannot, in principle, find the coordinate of neutrino production with an accuracy which is better than the oscillation length itself. And therefore, it's, there is no surprise that everything will be averaged out and you, you will not see any oscillations at all. It's a very simple explanation, actually, of how coherence for production or detection the same, exactly the same, um, is important for neutrino oscillation. Otherwise, you just cannot localize well the neutrino production point or neutrino detection point, well compared to the oscillation length. Okay, I hope that's clear. And, and the conditions essentially are that the size of the neutrino source and is much smaller than the oscillation length, and the size of the neutrino detector is much smaller than the oscillation length. Very, very natural conditions, actually. But here, when I talk about the size of the source, it's not only the size of, of, of your, for example, if you have a reactor, it's not the size of the reactor core. It's a more uh, stringent constraint. It is the size of the production region of every individual neutrino. This is a more stringent constraint. Okay. okay, but that's not the only possible source of decoherence, of loss coherence. Another source is a um, wave packet 
uh, separation. We know that propagating particles cannot be described by plane waves. They are described by wave packets, okay? which is a kind of uh, a train of, of plane waves. Okay? And nit neutrinos are no exception. Every propagating particle should be, strictly speaking, described by a wave packet. But neutrino wave packet has some finite size. As I mentioned to you, this size is typically much smaller than the size, all the sizes of interest, the size of the source, the detector, and the, the distance between the two. However, if you use propagate a very, very long distance, due to the fact that different mass eigenstate propagate with slightly different velocities, they can separate after some time and no longer overlap. As soon as this happens, the oscillations will be washed out. Exactly like in the case when the neutrino production or detection are in here. This is a propagation coherence. It's very easy to find the condition for this uh, violation of coherence or on the contrary, or for maintenance of the coherence. So the time after which neutrinos will, uh, neutrino wave packets will separate uh, is given by this formula, the velocity difference of two different mass eigenstates multiplied by this time is equal to the size of the wave packet. With larger times, the, the wave packets will be separated. Okay? Now, the coherent length is just the velocity of neutrinos times the coherence time. Now, delta V, which enters here, for relativistic neutrinos is given approximately by delta M squared divided by twice the energy squared. And from here, we immediately find the coherent length, which is given by this equation. Now, I mentioned to you that it's very difficult to imagine a situation in which neutrino production coherence or detection coherence is violated. The question is, can we have a situation in which neutrino propagation coherence is violated? The answer is yes. This is true for neutrinos from astrophysical objects. They propagate such long distances before reaching the Earth that the propagation coherence is actually lost. So neutrinos which we uh, detect coming from the sun or from supernovae, for example, they are mass eigenstate, they are not matter, have no flavor against So that's the only case we know in which we can say that we clearly detect mass eigenstate neutrinos. Of course, our detector can are only sensitive to the flavor. So how do we know that we detect uh, mass eigenstate? We know this only from this argument. In reality, we have a detector which can detect neutrinos of given flavor. But the probability will be just equal to the uh, projection of a given mass eigenstate on a flavor state which is detected times model, I mean, take it as a square modulus. We just project uh, mass eigenstate onto the detected flavor state, take the square modulus, and this will give us the relative probability of detection uh, of this mass eigenstate. Um, is it clear or not? I mean, or, or should I write maybe some formula here? No question. Right, right. Sorry? Please okay, write. okay. So assume we know, for example, that neutrinos coming from a distant supernova propagate huge distance such that u1, u2, and u3 no longer propagate as one whole state. So each of them is a wave packet. Okay? So initially it was a superposition of the three. Okay? But then they propagate with slightly different velocities. But over very long distances, that's enough for them to separate. You in depth of this, you have something like this. And of course, such interference do not oscillate. These are mass against states. And the, the lightest one arrives first, then the second one, and then the highest one arrives later. So this is, assume, U1, that is the lightest one. Okay? So we detect it in a detector which is sensitive to electron neutrinos only. So what we should have in this case, what would be the probability of detection? This probability will be uh, proportional to the projection of this new one onto the electron state. The neutrino, I wrote the formulas for you presenting uh, the flavor state as linear superposition of mass against it. But since it's a unitary transformation, you can invert it and write instead the mass against state as a linear superposition of flavor states. Of course you can do that. And therefore new one is a linear superposition of new e, new mu, and new tau with the weights which are given new, sorry, u, 
e1 squared u mu 1 squared and u tau 1 squared. And if our detector is only sensitive to electronegativeness, it will detect this state but with a weight which is proportional to this fact. And that's it. Very simple. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But, but they were, it may arrive three hours later. It may arrive three hours later. No, no, I mean, <laughs> new two will be again detected. This is new two, okay? It will be detected with the weights here. I just substitute one by two. And that's it. This is the weight, yeah. Here there is no weight. New two is orthogonal. These two states are orthogonal. Right, if you have the two flavors, right. But, but that's a different state, maybe several hours later. Okay, okay sure, yeah. Okay, yeah, so if we have it just simple two flavor uh, situation, this is cosine square and sine square, right. Of mixing, huh? mixing. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. For the detection, it's only square. For the whole process, it's force power. Yeah. But for detection only, assume we know already that it's new one. And we know it by the time of uh, arrival. You okay. I'm sorry. Uh, you told uh, yesterday about uh, supernova, which came in... 1987. Yeah. And so we could measure time uh, of paint by the detection of photons. Yes. So is it possible to distinguish that three waves? Well, you see, the point is that um, uh, the total pulse of supernova neutrinos uh, was detected within around 10 seconds. And the time separation for each individual mass eigenstate component of different state, in this particular case, was small. So you cannot say that this was new one, this was new two. Mm -hmm. So because the, this separation time was smaller than, than the total time duration of the pulse from supernova 1987. I'm just talking about what in principle could be. In, in reality, it's complicated because we have a bunch of very many neutrinos produced in supernova. And you cannot say that this one is coming from separation of a packet of this particular neutrino, or it will be from, from another neutrino, which they, they emitted a huge number in a very short period of time. But it's important, it's a matter of principle. We know for sure that neutrinos which are coming to the Earth from the supernova or from the sun, by the way, are coming as mass eigenstate and not matter eigenstate. And not flavor eigenstate, I'm sorry. Not flavor eigenstate. And actually, let me again, jumping ahead, mention another thing. Uh, we'll discuss later, tomorrow probably, the uh, matter effect on neutrino oscillation, the MSW effect. It turns out that matter can strongly modify the picture of neutrino oscillations. And in particular, uh, it matter whether we detect neutrinos coming from the sun during the night or during the day. During the night time, neutrinos come to our detector passing through the Earth because the sun is on the other side of the Earth. So the matter can affect uh, the flux of neutrinos because of I mean, matter of the Earth can affect the flux of neutrinos. And the result will be very different. The, the result of this effect, the size of the effect, will be very different depending on whether we assume that neutrinos are coming as flavor state or mass eigen state. And in fact, if they were coming as flavor state, you'd have this day-night effect about a factor of six bigger than it's predicted in the case when the uh, mass eigenstate. And this is already ruled out by experiment. So not only by simple theoretical arguments, but also by experiment, we know that solar neutrinos are coming as mass eigenstate, not as flame state. Otherwise, the day-night effect would be uh, much bigger and would have already been detected. There was a wrong paper on that, which was withdrawn. Um, a paper by Segal uh, from uh, and, and somebody else. 
and paper was withdrawn after Alex Chesnikov wrote a paper uh, explaining that uh, uh, the approach was wrong. They assumed that the neutrinos coming from the sun as flame of state uh, and calculated day-night difference or the solar neutrino flux and got a very big result, which by that time was allowed by experiment. Now it's just a little out experiment. Right. No, no, no. Well, it depends. It depends on which part of the energy spectrum you are. So they aim the. the uh, well, I, maybe I should jump ahead. Or I will discuss it either tomorrow or within. So it depends on, on the energy. Okay, I have very little time left. Uh, let me just give you a very interesting example of neutrino coherence. As I mentioned before. Uh, we know that if the detector is put very close to the source of neutrinos, we will not see any oscillations at all. Because the oscillation phase is zero and we get a zero probability. But it is not widely appreciated that even this simple fact is a clear evidence of coherence of production of and, and detection of neutrinos. It's a manifestation and, and, and uh, firm evidence for this coherence. Let me explain this in a very simple example. Consider for simplicity the two flavor cakes. Just two mass eigenstate and two flavor state. And consider production of electron neutrino species, for example, like in reactor neutrino experiment, and detection again of electron neutrino species by the detector at some distance from the source. Okay. Now, if the production and detection are coherent, we have to add the amplitude of contribution of different mass eigenstates. The production amplitude for nu1 is given by uh, proportion to cosine theta, and the detection is also proportion to cosine theta. And the production amplitude for nu2, when electron neutrino is produced, is proportional to sine theta, and the detection of this neutrino is also proportional to sine theta. Now, if we calculate the process, the, the amplitude of the process, we have to sum over both mass eigenstates, this kind of expression, and it will contain cosine square of theta plus sine square of theta times some phase difference. Square comes from the fact that we have first to emit neutrino and then to detect neutrino. Okay? And the same for, for the sine square. But there is some phase difference between two different mass eigenstates because of their propagation. Now, if we put the detector too close to the source, this phase difference will be zero. If we just get one, and with the, when we calculate the probability, we just take the square modulus of this amplitude, and we get one. So the probability of survival of electron neutrino is equal to one if we put the detector too close uh, to the source. Okay? Now what happens if the production and detection are not coherent? In this case, instead of adding the amplitudes, you have to add the probabilities. And instead of this, you immediately get cosine to the fourth of theta plus sine to the fourth of theta. And this is less than one. So the very fact, the very fact that we don't observe neutrino oscillation at short distances is a proof that neutrinos are produced, an experimental proof, that neutrinos are produced and detected coherently. Otherwise, we would see the reduced flux of electron neutrinos already practically at zero distance from the source. 